We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website, as Sean just mentioned. But we're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere online. Tonight, we've got a topic from the fine folk at Misdirected Mark Gaming Podcast, an excellent RPG roundtable podcast that offers a wide range of advice for people running and playing games. Okay, going way back at this point, I apologize it took us too, this long to get to this topic, but back on episode 358 of the Misdirected Mark Gaming Podcast, the crew talked about RPG artifacts. And what's amusing is I've seen they've now gone and edited the title of that episode to say game generated RPG artifacts. And what they were talking about were physical things that were created while playing the game. Right. So this is one of those things where we didn't necessarily agree with their definition uh, that they based the episode on. And, and that was there was some there was some discussion in the chat room that yep. happened and and some things. So they but they asked us to go ahead and try and do it. It's uh, do do it ourselves. Yep. We'll be sure to drop a link to that episode in the show notes for those of you who, who want to hear their take on the topic. Yeah, I actually even threw a link in the newsletter. So if anyone got our newsletter earlier today, they could prep before coming. Because <laughs> back when that show was recorded, I was there in the chat room and there was a lot of uh, debate over their definition of an artifact. And at one point during the show, one of the hosts basically challenged us that if you think you can do a better job, I wanna hear you do it. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We are going to tackle it. Now, I'm not gonna say we're gonna do a better job. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at artifacts in a different way than they did, right. which is going to include what they talked about, but be a little more all encompassing, which I think is a better way to look at the topic today. So to start off, what we need to do first is define what we mean by RPG artifacts. And this is this is sort of how their episode got to be where they are and why we're this, doing something different is this definition. Yeah, this definition. So so first off, when I'm talking about RPG artifacts, I don't mean the Eye of Vecna or the Deck of Many Things, right? We're, we're not talking about in-game mechanical artifacts, like, like the, the things that uh, plus five Holy Avengers and whatever. What we're talking about is physical artifacts. That's why the term artifacts, something physical that's left over once the game you're playing is done. The bits and bobs you can hold on to and go back to for weeks or months or years after you've done playing that game. Now, some of these could just be souvenirs, right? They're the things that are just gonna bring back fond memories. Like, oh man, do you remember when? Others may be things that you made and you can reuse over time, like a dungeon or an NPC you've created. Many of these are gonna be reminders of things that happened in the past if they're brought into future games. So this might be something where you stop playing for a few months and come back in. So this is gonna be great if you take a break and return. In some cases, it's gonna be the game itself because we're gonna make a permanent change to the game and the game itself becomes an artifact that has changed through play. Right, and now the difference, just so we can compare for those of you who haven't gone ahead and listened to the Misdirected Art Mark episode, their definition was very, very specific as mm -hmm. things that were created through the mechanics of the game only. So a character yes. sheet that was modified during the game is a game artifact under their definition, but a player handout or a map isn't because that is a pre-generated, not through, well, they depend, they depend. a modified right. map, maps, maps that change throughout the game <laughs> are, is, are, but a This, a, this a, is a where direct, the argument came yeah, up. A direct player handout was a, isn't. Yeah, basically it was alluded that the, a map created before the game didn't count, but if you created it while you were playing, it did. And I was like, well, there's still a map that's made for the game. Like, And we kind of got into the debate right there. So right. Jeff Seuss in our chat room, like, well, again, we'll be checking with the chat at the end of the topic, but Jeff Seuss has brought up one of the main ones they talked about on their show, which was the map in the quiet year. And that is definitely what they were focusing on was stuff made. But I think there are a lot more to it. I think that mementos and other things, anything that's left over at the end of the game can be set, considered an artist fact and i don't know i i realized they said that they weren't trying to value one more than the other but it felt like that it just right. felt like they were giving more impetus to one type of thing right. so anyway we're going to start off with some of the things so, so we this is a little more free form than our last episode which was very scripted this time we're just kind of opening this up for discussion so if you do have something in the chat feel free to jump in and i'm going to talk to start off with stuff that the players create 
And the first that Sean already mentioned is character sheets. I don't know a role player that doesn't keep their old character sheets, at least for a while. Like maybe they clean out the closet eventually or clean out their basement or clean out the garage and eventually throw them out. But I don't think there's anyone that doesn't keep their characters at the end of the game. Like when I go to a con, I hate it when the DM asks for the character sheets back. And I totally get why they do it. And Phil Vecchione very much pushes that if you're a DM at a con, ask for the character sheets back, especially if it's your own game, if it's a game you're developing, because what people put on those sheets tells you a lot about the design of the sheet and what can be improved. So like when I played with Phil, I actually at one con asked if there's a photocopy around because I want that artifact. I want to bring that character sheet home. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is that memento, right? That reminder that, oh, I remember when I played this character, this character was awesome. But there's more to it than that. What if I ever played again? What if I showed up to the next con and I did this? I show up to the next con and go, hey, you know what? I played Hydro Hackers before. We'll just stick with Phil's game since we're talking about Mr. Rack and Mark tonight anyway. Speaking of which, check out uh, Hydro Hackers on, on um, Drive Through RPG. Very neat hydro punk RPG that Sean and I both played and enjoyed. So I could show up the next week and I made a really awesome character the first time I thought called Sewer Rat. And he had this trench coat that was basically made out of duct tape and he would rip pieces of duct tape up to fix pipes. And he had a, he had an, a, a van with Poseidon pointed, painted on the side of it. I love this character. So the next time I played uh, Hydro Hackers, I actually showed up with the character and I asked him, I'm like, if no one else wants to play a plumber, I would love to play this character again. And that was two years later. And Phil was totally cool with it, but someone else wanted to play a plumber, which was fine. I played a different character. But it's that fact that you, and, and there's also part of it for the, the game that ended that you wish never did. And you know that will start up someday again, which usually doesn't actually happen, sorry to say. <laughs> but there's that aspect of keeping the character. She does that, that hope <laughs> that you'll get to play it, that character again. Yeah. No, you add on character sheets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't keep as many as you. I, I do occasionally throw them out. Uh, I'm, I'm not the super hoarder, but I mean, I have the rogue that mm. has played in more Warhammer games than I care to uh, admit. Um, uh, my, my third on black fist who yep. started off as a character for the back of the book uh, adventure yes. in the, in, and, and actually contract. replayed that same adventure as a more advanced character th and just went on through many different um different adventures and and absolutely there's uh i i i'm not one who will fight the you know if they want them back i totally get that and i'm, I'm happy to again i don't i'm not the character sheet hoarder but there are <laughs> definitely a number of character sheets over the years that i have a mm -hmm. real connection to and 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 held on to for that memory factor uh, right. Or in the case of, you know, my Warhammer, yes, I would absolutely you play again. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> it's that, that dream that we'll yeah. ever play again. We'll finish Death on the Reek someday in a retirement <laughs> home. So along with that, uh, the character sheets is obviously one thing that the characters create. But along with that, there's more to it for many games. Not necessarily. Like, sometimes you have a character sheet, you're done. But, like, there's player notes, right? So notes you take during the game. Um, short stories. I have played many games where character players have written short stories about the game. Whether that was extra homework, extracurricular stuff or experience, um, or something they just chose to do on their own. Um, one of the things I used to do when I ran a fourth ed Dungeons and Dragons game is whenever a player missed a session, if they wrote a story about what happened to their character while they were gone, like while the player were gone, while they were out of the group, I would give them full XP for the last session. So that story, background info, ton, some people love their background info and write 12 pages of it before they start to play. That's another artifact. Another one is there are games that create artifacts through play um, that the players create. And a great example of this is the Amber Diceless role-playing game. It would give you more character build points for doing things. So a big part of Amber is tarot. And it, through the tarot, you could talk to each other. So if you had someone else's tarot card, you could contact them. Well, there was actual in-game points if you created a tarot for your character or for the party. And they actually gave you build points for writing stories and creating worlds. Any of that character created, player created stuff is artifacts that can be saved after the game now my rough notes of the innkeeper's name and the name of the town and maybe what our our quest is i'll admit i don't keep most of that stuff like when we finish the hydro hackers i usually have a sheet or two of notes from the campaign i, I usually don't keep that i keep the character sheet but the other stuff it totally depends on what it is like i played ember and i have some artwork i drew for it that i still own uh the first thing that comes to mind for me is actually mechton mechs uh, mm -hmm. We barely ever played the game, but building and designing your mechs and working out uh, 
working out some concepts there was such great fun uh, that, you know, it was almost a traveler like experience in, in building mm -hmm. your mech uh, again uh, against the, you know, the traveler experience of character building. Uh, and so I think even though we only ever really played once, maybe twice, yeah, a couple times. Uh, I've still got some mechs, uh, you know, in my in my mm -hmm. character binder. Uh, and the other thing is uh, art. Um, I'm not particularly an artist. You're not, you're not going to see me sketching mm -hmm. out a beautiful character sheet. Uh, but I do uh, w work in 3D and working into things like your character, getting your character art. I've got, mm -hmm. you know, designs I made for character concepts. Even if I never brought them to the table, uh, it was my own visualization process for, for getting into the skin of that character. And I've still got all that art from, mm -hmm. from those characters that I worked on from way back in the day. And something that's even more common nowadays is people commission artwork. For absolutely. their characters. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. and that is that's an artifact. Like that that's a memento. That that's a keepsake. Right. If you get like I commissioned artwork for one of my dad's characters in the game. Now I'll admit it's an online MMO, but I for one of my dad's birthdays, my dad's notoriously hard to buy for. He plays Lord of the Rings online and at the time was playing it six to eight hours a day. Like this is what kept him sane when he retired because he needed something to keep him busy. So he ground in MMOs and he played the same character to the max level in the game without ever being in a party. And I got uh, an artist, Eric Quigley, amazing artwork. I'll try to remember to drop a note to Eric Quigley's work at some drew up his character. And like we have a it's framed in his room at um where he lives i'm not i don't think i need to say where he lives nope. yes where my dad lives there is there is a picture of a dwarf drawn by eric quigley on the wall yeah no absolutely and and especially now when you've got some more uh higher profile rpg stuff happening mm -hmm. uh it's common not only to get player art or commissioned art for your character but now Fan. you're also getting into fandom art Fan so art, i yeah. mean you know the critters for on thursday nights there's a lot of fan art out there mm -hmm. for critical role and i'm yeah. sure that there are other rpg uh, actual plays on twitch that are getting that same kind of of focus and and the fans mm -hmm. if a fan is creating art for my character absolutely that's an artifact of the game oh yeah definitely though not created in the game <laughs> so next just swap it over to the dm side of things uh you got gm side gm dm a referee, Hollyhock God, whatever you want to call them, um, for those games that have a GM role, they're going to have a lot more notes, right? And I think all of those are valid artifacts. You've got like um, the, the, the list of NPC names. You've got lists of places. You get city names. Um, I used to have index cards for NPCs. I had uh, all of it. All the, the story arcs, the encounters you never used. And the best thing about almost all of this stuff and why I think it's so important to keep these artifacts is so many of them can be reused. Whether it's reusing an entire adventure with a different group of players or just reusing names, places, all of that stuff. And I think every um, game master should have a list of names like that should like you can get them on the web now but if you have your own i like having my own there are i like having recurring npcs i like running my games and i'll bring up a character name and everyone immediately knows the personality of that character because i've used them in multiple worlds whatever whatever the background reason is maybe it breaks uh, the fourth wall a bit but i have some key npcs that i like to throw in all my games i think i like to think of it as the whole Morcock eternal champion thing but whatever so I, that's that's my my excuse for it but like i have so much stuff and I admit, there's some I should probably throw out, but like world creation and dungeons you've created and starship floor maps and just all that stuff. There's so much stuff, even in improv games. So, for example, the other day we played Runaway Hirelings. I have a list of the eight rooms, nine technically, with the, the final room, the eight rooms we went through. And that's a, a memento. I can look back on that and be like, oh, man, what was with us with a thousand? Everything was a thousand. <laughs> Almost every room we had in that game was the room of a thousand this or the room of a thousand that or the tomb of a thousand. We had a lot of tombs. Tombs and thousands was was kind of a key thing there. But all of that stuff, all the, all the GM prep work, that, that made it to the game and the stuff that didn't because the stuff that didn't make it to the game can be used later. Absolutely. And I mean, this goes for anything. Uh, you know, I, I look at the same sort of thing in my, you know, my real career or my former career of, uh, of working on lighting shows, right? If you're going and you're doing all this prep to put up a giant show, a lot of that stuff is going to be, sometimes you're making, you know, you're building a, an Excel spreadsheet to make your life easier on something. Well, it's still going to make your life easier next time. You just have to change some of the values. 
Uh, and, and that same thing goes for your lists. One of the, the great things about the internet is, sure, you can get a randomized list of anything, mm -hmm. but you lose a lot of personality. So, yes, I can get a randomized list of every baby name ever and mm -hmm. then every surname ever and, and pick my character names from that. But you lose a lot of, of the natural personality of your table when you do that. And so maybe that's a great place to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. But once you've started... You can develop themes and 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 and, and directions that for your table, for your worlds that are a little more narrow and not, you know, you're not getting a Bob and an Iliothra, you know, mm -hmm. married and living together in the same. And maybe, you know, maybe that is your thing. Maybe that maybe that's how you'd like to do things. But yep. again, that is make it your thing and and reusing things can be a great way to get that happen. So getting rid of that random prep stuff you did, whether you used it or not, uh, you know, can really help you in the next game and mm -hmm. speed along your prep. And same thing, just as, as a, a tip, create these things as you're playing. Like even if you're doing a completely improv game, if you come up with an NPC name on the fly, write it down. And then if you do that, every time you do it, eventually you're going to have a random list of names that sound like names you would use. If that makes sense, instead of sounding like stuff off a random list. Yep. No, Absolutely. All right, moving away from the, the, the DM notes and the player notes, whether those are, are, are character sheets or places or whatever, I want to move on to maps because I think maps specifically stand out as a unique style of artifact. I love gaming maps on every social media platform I've ever been on. I make a collection of them. Um, I find ones other people are sharing and I like to share save them. I've got a Pinterest board. I love maps, whether that's fantasy, sci-fi, whatever. I, I'm a huge fan of maps. And there are two types, though, that are important here for artifacts, right? there is the created before the game there's the the i sat down and made a dungeon or i went online and i went to dyson logos who's my favorite mapper and i found one of his maps and i i keyed it i i uh seeded the dungeon right i did the work or whatever i there, there may be beforehand there, there are games that the dm gm will present while playing the other side though would be what more modern games are doing which is creating styles of maps during play so first off, looking at the before the game maps, right? You've got your world maps, your dungeon maps, your city maps, your floor plans, your encounter maps. And these can be everything from a detailed gridded map to just a loose drawing with zones on it, right? For a fate style game where you've got like the alley and then you've got the fire escape as another zone and the top rooftops of the building and the street as four different zones. That still counts as a map. Yeah. Or you could have the... Um, the very detailed hex by hex walls, secret doors, rotating rooms reminds you of Bard's Tale style dungeons, right? Like we're talking about all of those made before the game. Yeah. And that includes, you know, handouts from purchased uh, adventures. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're buying scenario X from company Y and it comes with maps for city A, B and C and dungeon D and, you know, sewers Q, those are artifacts. Now, the biggest problem with those artifacts is deciding who gets to collect yes. them and keep them at the end of the game. <laughs> I default to the person running the game since they're doing doing all that work in a way, but uh, it's up to your group. <laughs> now, what's more common nowadays, and it did exist back in the past, so there's the during the game mapping. Now, part of that's going to be your old school D&D thing, right? Way back with Dungeons & Dragons, there used to be player roles. And I don't know how many people are actually aware of this. And I bet you a bunch of modern D&D players would be like, oh, my God, that's insane if they'd heard about it. But like one of the roles at the table was the caller. And that was the only person was allowed to touch to the talk to the dungeon master. Yes, I'm serious. There was only one player that was actually allowed to interact with the dungeon master. But another one that's important to our conversation here was the mapper. And that person was in charge of drawing the map because at that time, the dungeon master would only describe what the players see. And it was up to that mapper to interpret it. And the players would never see a map. You would never have the DM draw it ahead of time or put out dungeon tiles or get out the her starts or any of that stuff or have your dwarven forge, right? And if the mapper screwed it up, oh, the players got lost. Like that was a thing back in the day. Play, playing your D&D, &D, your old school D&D &D, was very much like sitting at your computer and playing your text adventure Whereas if you didn't have your grid paper next to you and you weren't paying close attention mm -hmm. to whether or not you went north, south, east, or west, man, you were never getting back out of there again if that you messed oh, yeah. up that one square. 
<laughs> and all oh, the worst were those you know, like rotating rooms and teleporters and trick rooms and oh yeah. it's some people still enjoy that style of play i actually don't mind it now and then but it's like uh we're gonna try this for a while yeah so that's that's the old school during the game but what's way more popular nowadays is the new school game where a part of the gameplay a huge part of the gameplay is creating a map before play which gets the players invested in that map right away sourcing the entire table to create things so examples of this is uh jeff has mentioned the quiet ear and based on that we already mentioned hydro hackers is neighborhood creation and when you start hydro hackers you start by drawing a straight line and that's main street and as everyone introduces their character they have to add something to the map and they draw us and they add something whether it's and it has to be something tied to the character right so when i did it i did the auto repair shop which is where i got my van service plus it was on underground plumbers well plumbers were like hackers right that's where that's where i got all my plumbing gear and i added that to the map another example of this is iron edda from the uh the amazing tracy barnett where you make the hold fast you make the the viking uh village basically before you start playing in the stuff in the the, the area around it um another example is city building in dresden files when you sit down to play the fate version of dresden files um you sit there and build a city that you play in whether it's your version of windsor or it's a totally made up city you all add buildings and villains and people and movers in it um uh, we mentioned runaway hirelings earlier the list of rooms before we started playing that we had no clue what our eight rooms were going to be you actually come up with them during play and this has become very popular um i it hasn't really branched into the D style play i don't see it much where the players are creating the dungeon like even dungeon world doesn't really push uh, for players creating the dungeons, but it is definitely popular where any game where the players should have a home base, right? Any place where the game has a central focus, I think is a brilliant idea to have the players create that with the game to get them invested. And it makes a fantastic artifact at the end. At the end of the game, here's your neighborhood. Here's your city. Here's your, your thing you built together. Uh, microscope is another example that came up again on on the podcast. Uh, we've talked about it before in the show, mm -hmm. and they they talked about it during that show. And that's a game where you're build you're you're building the world around you uh, as you go, uh, you know, through yeah. through index cards and slowly shaping the world around you. And that's just you know how things go. Uh, you know, Blades in the Dark is another one where you can really it's it's a you know you're looking at or or all the Forged in the Dark games. You start with a concept, but as you go, you can build things. You don't need to have your entire city mapped out mm -hmm. in advance. Uh, that's something that can develop through the gameplay as you're developing all the other factions and everything else around you, uh, both through play and through character development. Uh, it's it's evolving so that the DM doesn't have to know exactly what everything in the city is everywhere in advance. Yeah. And it's a huge change from the the very old school purchased setting material, like the Forgotten Realms, where every building on the map has already been detailed by someone before you. And a big part of prep was memorizing that area of town the players were going to be in, which, again, there's nothing wrong with that style of play. And some people do still dig it. And there is something to be said for exploring someone else's world and having a shared experience of exploring a world that every other player around the world can experience, which is something I do find is lost in these modern games yeah. because my game of hydro hackers is going to be nothing like Sean's game of hydro hackers, because we are going to build a totally different neighborhood. We're going to have totally different characters. Our threats are going to be totally different and you lose that shared experience. So it's, it please don't think that we're put, saying one is better than the other. Yeah. We're just saying they are two different things, but they both create fantastic artifacts. Absolutely. And, and it, to be on, to be fair, they are somewhat uh, shared experiences. They're just a very different shared experience. Well, so if I've, if I've gone through, you know, the Underdark and, and played through that uh, or, you know, a, a set known uh, campaign, uh, especially, you know, D&D &D 4, uh, going through the league play, mm. it's going to be the same. And we are all going to say, oh, how did you handle blah yeah. and something? But there's also the experience of, oh, I had such a great time playing Hydro Hackers. We went this way and this happened. Oh, really cool? Because we went this way and this whole other thing happened. Mm. And, and, and the experience of the differing and, and how your characters, who may have been playing the same classes, but because of personalities, things branched, uh, it's an experience of the, the interest of 
of the differing of the of the the game mm-hmm. being so different that is the shared experience in in a in a strange way. Yeah, in a weird. I, I don't know if I, that it's shared experience or just game experience. It, it's a shared experience with a theme, right? But it'd be a totally different setting or story. Yep. Like there's no way you tell the same stories. Nope. But again, the artifacts created are are the important thing for tonight. Now, right. all the maps we talked about now are are pretty much like what do you think of a map? Like a fold out map. Do people know that maps still fold out? I don't even know <laughs> if that's still a thing. Um, zoom, zoom but there in. are other types of maps too, right? Like relationship maps. And I will always forget, always remember. I got I got to try to find this picture online and post on Twitter when we were playing Feng Shui or Feng Shui or however you want to pronounce it. First edition, I had so many interweaving plots with the different factions of the secret society growing that we sat down and put it on a whiteboard with all of the lines and who's connected to where. Like that right there is a map. Now, unfortunately, I put it on a whiteboard, but everyone at the table took a picture. And at the time, that involved getting a camera for some of us because this was not quite the age of <laughs> cell phones. Um, so that that is one, relationship maps or your clue web, right? Like your, your cork board with all the strings or your murder board, whatever you want to go with. Those are just as, as valid, just as other types of maps. It doesn't have to necessarily be a dungeon map. Same thing with the DMs if they use a plot map for their adventure creation instead of well there's lots i'm not going to get into different ways to create adventures but if they do use a plot map for example for for designing their game that becomes an artifact at the end of the game these are the ones that i find are particularly awesome for returning to the game later for that you took a huge break you haven't played in months and you sit down and you're like oh wait a minute what were we doing that's where i find these types of maps are extremely useful Absolutely. Uh, and there's there's also thing, you know, so many games can buy this, even going back to the older games, when you look at games like uh, Vampire the Masquerade uh, mm-hmm. back in the day, you know, trying to figure out the your per, your, you know, the way you fit into the Camarilla and how your vampire who was, you know, a Malkav was re- dealing with the, you know, this other faction over here and this other faction over here and, you know, all of a sudden they brought in werewolves. And so now you've got all these factions and, you know, these relationship maps are something that you, at a certain point you needed to start drawing out yeah. because after a couple of gameplays, uh, it would be easy to forget, you know, how things had evolved so that the Malkav was now working with the fairies to overthrow the, you know, loop the, the Lycan warlord. <laughs> That sounds like a good plot right there. <laughs> I'm start running uh, World of Darkness again. There you go. No, I totally agree. All right, next. Instead of things that, that are written down, right? Like most of these things are things that are drawn, created in some way. I want to talk about some some more physical things, some tangible items that are, that are not just notes on paper. And the first one that came to mind when I was thinking about this was miniatures. Now, whether that be miniatures you bought for the game which is what most people do like new ones like a, a new set of getting a new mini for a character was always a big thing for me whenever i play D D, i will buy a new miniature not only that i will not say buy i will find a miniature to represent that character i own lots i will find one of my existing miniatures to be that character i will paint that miniature and then i will buy dice that match the color of the paint i put on that miniature and i color coordinate it i will buy the primary die for the game so that'd be a d20 for, for D&D, and then I will go with, like, if it's an archer and uses a bow that uses a D8, I'll also buy, like, the D8. Or if I'm a wizard, maybe I'll buy, like, a bunch of D4s for Bless or something like that. So to me, that is an artifact, and I tend to keep those together in a baggie where I have, like, the miniature and the dice all together. Um, painting a miniature of your character becomes such a great memento. And again, something that can be used again if you ever play that character again, or you play another character like it. If it's just, I always play Elven Rangers and I always use the same miniature. That works too. Um, and to go with that is uh, something that's very popular with some groups is the scenery that you create for your game. And um, this, I'm thinking of all the Dwarven Forge stuff, the 3D paper scenery. The If you watch Critical Role now, they're all about the Dwarven Forge stuff for their games. Um, whether that's pictures of the awesome scene that was built or if it's you're able to actually keep the piece. I, I personally, I love making, what I use is 3D pieces for my games. I haven't made many pieces of scenery, but the ones I did, I am very proud of. And I reuse all the time because I'm like, I'm going to bring this out again because it looks awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing I think of right now uh, is the pyramid that showed up at Extra Life last yes. year. Um, 
there was a Warhammer game that went on an extra life. And I mean, it was uh, it was a long game. It was, it was like 12 hours. Yeah, it was yeah. about a 12 hour game. But the characters both approached a pyramid and then worked their way down through the levels of the pyramid, which were removed piece by piece. And there was lighting inside of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was an amazing artifact of a game. And I hope that those people took all the pictures of them of them playing their way through this fantastic monster. I mean, a four foot, four foot by four foot base pyramid. I mean, at least was, yeah. this was a huge uh, piece. Uh, and he had fully painted uh, Warhammer, uh, you know, demons and things in the base of it mm -hmm. you know, throughout. It was it was an amazing experience. And I would absolutely consider every picture taken of that game to be an artifact. And that's something I would love to see more people do. And one of the, the, the things I, I blew away players by this back in the day, I didn't do it for every session in fourth head D&D, &D, but I was running a special event. It was when the D&D &D red box came back out. And what I did is I painted up all the miniatures for the characters. This was pre-gens. And what I let the players do when they left is I let them take those miniatures home. I let them, I gave them a D20. They again, painted to match. I, we, we actually, because this was a re-release of the red box, we went and got game science D20s. Right. We got everyone crayons. They had to color in their dice before they started. And I gave them painted miniatures. They were from like 1978. I managed to find old chivalry and sorcery miniatures for each of the characters, painted them up and then let the players keep the character sheets, keep the dice, keep the crayons and keep the minis and take them home. And I've had people come back years later and contact me on Facebook going, Oh, look what I just found. I remember that game. That game was fantastic. And they became such a great artifact for those games. Now, one thing that I don't have any artifacts from, but I wish we did was our early adventures in Clayorama. Oh yeah. <laughs> Nature, so. um, but that was literally a game where, I mean, you, you in theory could walk away with an artifact at the end. If you brought your own clay or Lego into it, home. Uh, you know, it was a game where you you built things out of Play-Doh and, and, and what you built and how you interacted with your Play-Doh was your character and how the game evolved. Yep. And, uh, you know, if you could at the end of it, you could literally take home your Play-Doh thing and, and you, mm -hmm. you that you created uh, uh, through the game and for the game. Now, to go with the miniatures, of course, there's also the map tiles, right? Or battle maps and stuff. Now, most of the time, this is something a lot of people like to use the dry erase or the wet erase. Or they use like the D&D dungeon tiles. And then when they're done, you just pick them all up. And I always find that disappointing. Because what happened was when I was running D&D 3.5, a uh, huge long campaign that the characters got up to like uh, like 13th and 14th level, which was huge for us back in the day. I realized that some groups have gone up to 20, 30, 40, whatever. But that was the longest we ever played a D&D campaign. I had gotten involved with a company called Gaming Paper. And I love their stuff. It was like um, that brown paper that like butchers use, but it had a grid on it and it was dirt cheap. Like it, like not ridiculously cheap, but like, like five bucks for a roll of this stuff. And it came in rolls and I drew out all of the maps on that. And I loved it because I still have all those. I just rolled them back up. I still have all those maps. And I'll never forget the one time I was playing with twos, um, local gamer who colored the map as we were playing. They, they, they happened. I had, I had extra markers out because there were areas I wanted a fog of war to draw, draw while I was playing live. And they sat there and got a hold of the markers and colored all the orcs' beds. And one of the orcs slept in rainbow sheets. And fair enough. It, it's not like she was overly distracted and not playing the game. So I was perfectly fine with it. Uh, but that is such an artifact. I can go get that map. It's downstairs in my basement. And I can pull it out with all the, the colored beds and colored tables and colored rugs that were drawn on it. And I think that's something you lose when just using like a, a battle map where you, you know, get a Mike Schley map and you print it out and you put it on your table and it's done. And even more so with like roll 20, right? Like that's even more ephemeral. There's something to be said for that map you draw at the table that you get to keep at the end. And like, even with like the best you can do is take a picture, right? So even if you're using your, your dungeon tiles or whatever, get a picture of it before you put it away and at least you have that memento. Yeah. Yeah. And again, even, even stuff like Gloomhaven, right? Where you're random maps, but you're just setting out, their tiles based on their setting yeah. there there's there's really nothing to take away from that on the the map side there are there are i think artifacts within the gloomhaven that we we, we might get to but yeah uh, the the maps uh aren't part of that really no they're not uh all right moving away from those talking about more physical things are props i don't know how many people i don't know how popular they are how often it happens based on my uh my 
Twitter stream, it looks like they're getting more popular, especially with cosplayers being involved. But many people over the years have brought props to my games. And many times as a GM, I've created props for the game, whether this be the, you know, tea soaked, put in the oven for a couple minutes map or a puzzle piece or... Um, uh, we used to use, or there was a candlestick I remember using once as an artifact. There's the stuff we picked up at Value Village and resale shops that have ended up in our games as whatever artifacts or treasure chests or whatever. I, all of that stuff, all of those props are, are very obviously artifacts or mementos. Those are things that for one can be reused. Second, they're reminders of the games you've used them in. And fourth, they're just cool bits like bits and bobs. You can have tchotchkes you can have around your house. Absolutely. And there's so many ways. I mean, this can be stuff that people whip up at the table sitting around yeah. as something comes up and they, 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 you know, some, there are people who are way more crafty than I am who can, who can, you know, put together things right there at the table or between sessions going home and, and, you know, oh, I made this super awesome thing and I'm going to, my character is not going to be without this from now on. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make the, the wand of whatever, or the staff yep. of this or potion bottle of this, because it's, it's become such an integral part of my character. Yep. And I'm going to bring that to the table straight mm -hmm. on, right on. Uh, this is actually something that, uh, you know, I actually have, and I'm not even sure where to put it in here. It's sort of, uh, between what we have now and, and what we got next is, uh, I was playing, I was coming down to play a game of star of star Trek. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I knew, and we had discussed in advance that I was going to play the engineer. Uh, so I went out and I literally purchased six hours of learn to speak in a Scottish accent, uh, audio books. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so that by the time I got down to Windsor, uh, I would be able to play a proper Star Trek engineer with a Scottish accent. Wow. Um, and I've still got, you know, I, I you know, if, if I ever need another Scottish character, I've got the, uh, the reference material there to, uh, to build up an accurate accent. Cause I didn't want to do this stupid, uh, you know, just. Well, like what, like what, like I did the last time we were, I was down there and streaming <laughs> yeah, my, right. my, uh, my Australian British accent. Um, but you know, I, I, I had a, a, a wow. uh, legitimate, I learned something. Scottish I didn't know accent. Sean did this for that game. Oh yeah. That was one of the most epic games ever. Like we had <laughs> such a good time playing that game. So there, there's one on my list, the, the audio uh, training tools that you download or purchase to improve your performance at the table would be artifacts. So if you, you, well, that's actually the, let's expand on that a bit more. I have bought multiple books on how to prep improv DMs. Um, I'm totally blanking on names of these books. I've like, never unprepared was the prep one, but like I own um, play unsafe is another one that was all about learning to improv better at the table. Like those are all artifacts that were between games that affected my ability to play and definitely improved it. So I think that's a definitely a valid thing. Things you have purchased or, or created to improve your gameplay. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much, especially as a DM that can really uh, be purchased or, or found or developed um, as part of prep, not as a specific game, but as prep to be a DM, uh, as prep towards your 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 general movement, like learning and concepts mm -hmm. and ideas and building up concepts in the back of your head, not specifically I need this city block for this city, right? But I need to have a better vision of what the cyberpunk community I'm going to be running is going to be. I you know I need yeah. to read this book because it will shape the vision of the city that I'm going to be creating with my mm -hmm. players is just as valid as drawing out a map of the city. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not what I had thought of. So along with the, the props are also the player handouts, right? Any the notes you've created for your players and, and all games, I, you don't seem to see player handouts as often anymore. And I think a lot of that goes towards the fact that most games are more improv based with less prep. So it's hard to do because like you as the, the tenant of player powered by the apocalypse games is play to find out what happens. You can't have those props created ahead of time. And in a way I feel they're losing something because of that, but then they gain a whole other aspect of gameplay and buy in from the players and all that other stuff. So again, I'm not trying to say one's better than the other, but there's just the, the time of player handout. I remember my favorite, 
mod one of one of the best RPG modules ever written is for the Judge Dread role playing game from Games Workshop, and it's called Slaughter Margin, and it is because of the amount of props in that. Besides the fact they have maps and tokens for every single thing in that module, so you can set up a map instantly at any time for any situation. It's the fact that it had. Um, one of the big things on Judge Shred is their law master would put out printouts from the, which shows when the game was written and when the comics were written, but printouts would come off on your bike and it would give you your mission. And if you asked more about a perp, it would print it off. Well, it gave you printouts of all of this stuff in case your players asked for it. So you get your mission briefing, yes, but like the every name that's on that sheet, they could ask for more information and you would hand them the printout for that. Every location, there was a printout for that. Every npc that was in the bar where you have the first fight every name there was literally a printout for every single patron of that bar just in case one of the players was like okay i call up headquarters and ask for i forget what you called them that there shows how long it's been <laughs> since i was into judge right scream sheet or whatever give me a scream sheet of whatever uh sean stevens who was at this this bar and you had it to hand to them and it was amazing just the, the sheer amount of props and i know they recently did this and here's an example of modern games doing it the call of cthulhu Whatever the the big Call of Cthulhu, Mask of Nyarlathotep, I think it is. They put out this like deluxe box set that has like stuff, ephemera, like just all these handouts and things to get players more involved. And again, every single one of those, every piece of paper can be an artifact. Yeah, and I, you know what? Anytime you're playing a horror game, um, I this is where you need handouts or. Uh, you need, uh, you know, you're, whether you're building a murder board or whatever clues that you're you're finding. Chill is a is a great example mm -hmm. of a game that I think just demands player handouts. Right, you've got to find that note that was left over in the you know the dirty mm -hmm. motel you went investigating into, or you know things you found checking out a crime scene. Uh, you know those games really kind of thrive on that sort of thing. Whereas maybe you can justify avoiding a little more in your fantasy games other than, you know, a few tea stained notes here and there. Uh, but when you get into that, that sort of the gritty noir detective uh, uh, genre, it just cries out for, for having that physical thing to link you. Mm -hmm. into I think part of it too, is the more modern you get, the more you can easily have props. Right. that fit right yep. like you can because you can't hand someone a flaming sword or <laughs> you know or, or you know the gem of many eyes that glows or whatever whereas it's like the handgun looked like this and you hand them a squirt gun right like or whatever whatever the case may be right i think that's part of it but yeah i agree totally that, that especially those gritty noir the the more down and dirty the game is the more it feels like it should have the players touching things right whereas again if you move into cyberpunk uh, you know, your your cyberpunk games are going to have less of that because your concepts are more digital. You're, they're more ephemeral. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, it's it's a it's a screen that you're reading rather yes. than that that physical thing. The only physical things out there are things that are try that may be trying to avoid ever being put into mm -hmm. the net. Though I did see an awesome use of modern technology, a Gamma World game, seventh edition Gamma World from Wizards of the Coast. In the middle of the adventure, the characters find a web address. And they put it into your phone or whatever. At that time, there were enough people had phones. And you watched a video of an alien sneaking around in a garage that gave you a hint to solve the thing. And it was literally you punted in your code and you could watch the video. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's a pretty cool modern prop. Yeah, no, and I could I could totally see um, if I, I I would actually almost love to be a co DM on somebody, you know, where, you know, you're just mm -hmm. you're, someone's come up with something and they need something. And it's like, hey, can you create a video? to show this i'm like sure give me yeah. you know by next week i'll give you a video that your players can watch there you sort go. of thing that could that could definitely be a fun uh definitely a fun be a fun, and then again you get to keep the video right you throw it up on youtube for Absolutely. everyone else Absolutely. you know once out. the game's over there you go it's there for everyone to see forever so we're talking about lots of physical props and i think something that goes with that they again is growing in popularity but popular even back when i first started playing in the 80s was costumes Showing up dressed like your character was a thing. My most famous costume is I have a GM outfit, a, a, a high programmer outfit for when I ran paranoia. I have a set of white robes that I would put on whenever I ran paranoia. 
And I, that was my high programmer outfit that I wore when I ran it. Now, unfortunately, it ended up in the wash with something black and then they became gray robes. So I don't <laughs> longer have that artifact. Plus, I was like 13 at the time and I highly doubt I would fit anything I wore when I was 13. But costumes are definitely a thing. People now cosplay as their characters but not only that people cosplay as other people's characters which that part still blows my mind like that was the part to me where i realized that dungeons and dragons had reached a new plateau of pop culture is when people started cosplaying as other people's characters yeah no absolutely and uh you know danielle who's not in our chat room tonight unfortunately yep. is you know shows up at, at cons in costume and it's awesome yep. it's great to see uh, whether that's, you know, whether it's a costume just generic, whether it's a costume for a game she intends to play, has played, uh, or or something she doesn't play but she enjoys and she watches, mm -hmm. you know, whether whether you're a critter watching the Critical Role stuff or you just happen to like, uh, you know, character X from book X in, in System Y, um, mm -hmm. that's awesome and that's great. And, and what you have created, what you have put together is an artifact. Definitely. Like those costumes, like I know people have like put their costumes on mannequins and have them displayed in their house. Like it's, it's definitely a thing. Absolutely. All right. Here's some, we're, we're getting near the end. Bear with it. We're a little bit longer than I thought it would take us to get through this, but it's awesome because we come up with some stuff I didn't think of. Here's some stuff that I don't know what people would think of as artifacts that I actually think are, and that, that tend to stay with the group of the game. And now the first one we kind of alluded to, and it kind of goes with the city building, but that's the 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 stronghold rules for D&D &D going way back in the day the the keep rules or the the superhero headquarters from Marvel superheroes or the thieves den in Warhammer um the the home base the thing the players create and what to me sets these apart from the the group player creation is these are often done independently of the dm these are usually things that are done in the game that the player themselves just sit and do on their own it's, it's like a lonely fun for the players as opposed to the the group creation which is why i want to call them out as something separate yeah absolutely uh i still have the casino that my rogue built uh and you know worked out and you know we, we figured out how the casino was going to work and you know where the cheating was going to be and where the games were <laughs> fair and you know what kind of a profit it would be able to turn in you know a given in uh you know a given period of time and that was all something that was designed and i mean we, we took the warhammer rules that were there and and there was some consul consultation with the the dm of course but it was mostly just me sort of coming up with mm -hmm. the cool you know retirement uh, initiative for my rogue another one now here's where where things get really abstract and i think this is a very valid one um that i don't even know if the misdirect and mark guys caught and this is when you create new stuff for the game that will continue when you play the game in the future so new equipment uh we did talk about making mechs for for mechton earlier so i think that falls into here making new gear New moves, uh, for anyone who plays Powered by the Apocalypse, lots of people make new moves for their games because they're playing and they find they're missing something. So they create a new move and then they'll use that move and everyone going forward. A very common one for Dungeons and Dragons that has been around since the 70s is creating new spells. Every version of D&D has had very detailed rules for creating new spells. And once you create those new spells, they're now part of the game. And the game now has those artifacts in them. If you read the first edition D and D, you're not going to find Nistel's Magic Order or Tensor's Floating Disc because Tensor and Nistel hadn't made them yet. But if you look at the AD and D book, you're going to find those, and those are artifacts from actual games played with Gary Gygax and his friends. Mike Nistel is the one who made Nistel's Magic Order. Tensor's Floating Disc. I can't remember the name of the the, the, the player, but again, it was a player at the table created that, and how that is still in the current edition of D and D. So that's an artifact that has made it into the rules and is still there. 30 years later which i think is really cool but it's just as valid that you were going to make these things for your own game whether it's a, a new sword a new item a magic item uh i'm so stuck in fantasy in my head right now for some of your programs and cyberpunk or yep. a new set of gear or your van you made for shadow run or your your modified t95 freighter in star wars uh and i find i think uh again i i haven't delved in a bit and maybe jeff will uh Pop, uh, pop in more on his knowledge of Forge in the Dark stuff, but there's a lot of that sort of creation there in that game, uh, and and not necessarily in the, the moves as much, but with uh, act, ways of doing things and, and and directions that your group is going to go into, and and finding new ways to to build things out and new ways to to 
you know, find new clocks to, to throw into things uh, and advance that just make a whole lot of sense. And you incorporate that into the game from then on. Uh, right. I think, I think most of the older players have built spells or, or worked with other people to build spells. I was never a mage, but I was always happy mm. to sit down with the mage and work through to try and balance that new spell they wanted. So mm -hmm. it made sense and, and, and worked within the system. So similar to this, here's another one that if, if is thinking outside the box, but I think is a definite artifact for your group are the house rules you come up with. Every group pretty much and e running every game over time develops their own preferred way to play. And that's one of the things that makes role playing games fantastic is that they provide you with the framework and it's up to the group to modify that framework to have the most fun. The house rules for your group are an artifact of your game group and your games. Whatever that happens to be, whether that be the fact you never use encumbrance and you don't use weapon speed modifiers or the fact that I, I those are the just the two <laughs> obvious house rules that everyone's used for years. Ammo, I don't, food, I don't house rule that much. Food, you know, that, that's yeah, what yeah. I think. The, the, you, everyone that runs D and D, even three point five or fifth edition, has some weird rule for ammo, whether they track it or not. Or the the the, the outside game, the fourth rule, fourth wall breaking rules we had. Like if you rolled a botch, you had to eat a banana, and that box of the bag of bananas we had, it was not fresh. <laughs> that was that was one of those those that was a house rule. The fact that I described earlier that I had a rule in my fourth ed D, D game that if a player wasn't present they had to come back the next week and if they could tell a story of where their character was during that time period and everyone bought it though to be honest if they just had a story we bought it we, we didn't really like push it they got full xp which is honestly it was just a way to, for me to give everyone full xp and not have to worry about players at different levels but it was great because everyone bought into it and i remember going back to props twos again showed up one week with this bronze statue of an androgynous man and that was the boyfriend her health had made met while she was gone in the Feywild and she had created this bronze statue of him because he died and she now had this prop to go with her character during downtime like that wasn't even part of the game but any of the house rules whether it's you get plus two when you do this to all dice explode on a three whatever they happen to be those are artifacts that is something that goes beyond the game it, it exists after you're done anytime you sit down to play a new game with someone during session zero you should always be asking do you have any house rules is there anything you do that's specific to your group that's not covered by the rule book and those things are artifacts that are going to carry over from game to game and they're very much usually created during play now some people i know like the house rule before they start playing personally we've shared my opinion on that before i always say play by the real rules first except batman we talked about that last week so I actually uh, consider in this, when we get into house rules, this actually creates uh, an artifact out of your player guide in some cases. Yeah. Uh, I would consider my two, second ed player's guide an artifact because it was, you know, it was where a lot of rules, notes and things got jotted down. You know, you, it's got an index, but it was never really the index you wanted. So you'd have notes scrawled in all the margins and, <laughs> you know, your, your, your player's guides, both for Warhammer and second ed back in the day were heavily marked up for quick reference for things. Now we've moved on to now uh, where player cards are a, a thing now where a lot of that would probably have been uh, either done in cards or index cards or whatever. But back in the day, it was that in that book, right? That, that, that guide was your your workbook at least for you i don't know i, I find people that write in their books insane <laughs> i don't have any notes in any of my books <laughs> all of my house rules are on pieces of paper no i, I didn't i am not one to draw in my books but i know other people have yep it's that i can't do it i don't know i can't draw <laughs> in my books the fourth ed uh player's handbook Dungeon master's guide i taped in the erratas but they're taped and you can actually take them out like the, I used a certain tape that could come off. I, I refuse to draw in my books, but that's, I can get it. Like uh, what you would find in mine is lots of loose sheets of paper shoved in different places. And that, that would be my, no, we fix this. We fix that. Uh, All right. We have spent uh, the entire episode today talking about role-playing games. And I was considering calling this tabletop artifacts and mementos, but really there's, this is definitely more of an RPG thing, but there is an aspect of this to some board games. Now, part of it's going to be your house rules. If you do house rule your games, 
again, I am very much against house ruling most board games, but it does happen now and then. Um, in general, we just stick to the rules as written. But if you do house rule your game, that is definitely an artifact that that sheet of paper you threw in your copy of Batman Talisman Super Villains Edition that says shuffle deck two and three together before playing that there's an artifact for you. <laughs> um, but there are games that specifically do create artifacts by the end of them and the biggest example of course and i think most people see where this is going are legacy games starting in particular with risk legacy because you played 10 to 15 games of risk legacy before reaching the end of the story and when you were done you could then continue to play your own unique board forever you literally created a unique risk legacy board at the end of the game that would be different from every other person's in the world which i that blew me away that is what got me to buy risk legacy despite really hating risk and i gotta say it's a much better version of risk too like that that wasn't the only thing but that's what got me to buy it and the fact that that exists and i've seen people with their risk legacy uh boards mounted on walls like people have saved them and mounted them on the wall no absolutely uh, and then another example of that, of course, is Pandemic Legacy. But then Pandemic Legacy, you can't keep playing. But you still have that artifact. You still have the, the board with all its stickers on it. And you've got the stuff you unlocked. I really don't want to spoil anything. You've got the characters that have their scars and their, their things on it. You have physical. I still have my copy of Pandemic Legacy. And there's no reason. Like, I, there's, I can't play it again. I can't use it. Maybe I could take the bits out of them, use it for something else. It's not like you can carry over anything to Risk Legacy 2, which is kind of sad. There should be at least something. Um, another example of this, though, that aren't Legacy games, or it's a Gloomhaven. We'll, we'll stick to Legacy games for a second. Gloomhaven. You are putting stickers on the board. You are leveling up your characters. You are modifying your deck. If you were me, you're ripping up cards. There are cards that are supposed to be removed from the game. I literally ripped them up. My copy of Gloomhaven isn't going to look like anyone else's copy of Gloomhaven by the time I'm done with it. Uh, and as well, uh, one thing we've talked about in the past, the Daniels uh, will take games that they are no longer using uh, and maybe have become, you know, destroyed through, uh, through play, legacy game, and take that box cover art and turn that into wall art, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, a, 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 an artifact of... The fact that, you know, you've beaten this game, you've you've achieved everything you can, and now yep. it's up there on the wall to remind you of that. To remind you. Very fair. Now, other games that do somewhat like it are um, like the, the Hogwarts battle. The fact that you are opening boxes and expanding the game. So by the time you're done, now I'll admit it's it's a little bit of a different artifact because by the time you're done, your box is going to be the same as everyone else's because we'll have unlocked everything. But from game one to game two, your box is going to be different from someone else's. And once you've opened box three, it's changed. And then there's another one um, that is the, uh, I'm drawing a blank, Fa Fabled series. So the way the Fabled series of games works is you start off with a deck of cards, you play a game, and then more cards. And then after you play that game, you add more cards. And I don't actually own any of these to know if by the end, everyone has the same deck or if there's branching paths where you'd add different cards. But at the end of the game, you have this deck of that game that's going to be different from where you started. No, absolutely. And uh, then Deanna pointed out one that I totally didn't think of. And that's the, the Detroit exit game. When you finish an exit game, you have all the bits left over. You've got stuff. Now, interestingly, some of these I've now found give you something that will continue on after the game that you get to keep and have, and that's kind of cool. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, so you'd have to play a couple of them to see these. Um, I, that w I No, I don't want to even give that away. <laughs> Just because we've only played three, and people could probably figure out which one it was in. Right. Uh, but you get something. But besides the, the something you can keep playing with, you've got all the stuff. And my kids love that stuff. They love the, the unusual objects. They have those, and they play with them, and they have the code and they've used them to make their own games and they have the the booklets with all the different funky art and puzzles on them and they use those for things and uh there was a thing we had to make in the last game that my daughter absolutely wanted to keep sean seen the picture of that thing yep. like there 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 there's bits left over from that game that's going to always remind us and a cool thing that they put in here's one for board games i just thought of that that isn't on our list is there's a score sheet and that that I don't care about them much, but I know some people very much do. On the back of every exit game is a score sheet, and we could keep that, and that would become an artifact of our play. And the same is true of score sheets in any game. 
And I know people who have kept score sheets from Scrabble in the end to keep their high score. Like, I know it's a thing. It's not something I ever cared about. When I get the pad of score sheets, I just tear off the top one, throw it out and keep playing. But I know people who like keep the pad and keep every game ever played in their box of the game so they can look back through their score sheets and be like, oh, I remember the time Dave got 56 points or I remember that game with Steve. So that is definitely an artifact of board games that I hadn't thought of is, is score sheets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and similar to score sheets, keep it in the box. Uh, I, Deanna brought this up in the chat room, play logs. Uh, again, it's not something you do, but there are a number of people who keep track of, you know, who they've played with mm -hmm. uh, in a box. So everyone who's played this game will be there on a sheet stuck inside the box or written on uh, done with the box topping inside the box lid. And, you know, that's, that is absolutely an artifact mm -hmm. in that game uh, recording who has been involved with your, your plays of it. Well, that's all the gaming artifacts we could think of. We're going to head over to Lobby now and see if anyone in the chat room has anything to add. All so, right, I saw a lot of good things in the a, chat. Absolutely. One thing, uh, board game, just since we, we, we finished on board games, if we keep on board games, uh, blank cards in, in games to add your own uh, your own cards into. Yeah. It's not a, not a super common thing, but there's plenty out there uh, which give you the uh, the option to add your you know, write your own rules or write your own or cards. Are those in there to write your own things or to replace any cards you may have missed? Because I th that may go missing. Well, I, I think, always thought they were there to replace missing components. I think it's changed. I think originally, absolutely. Older games, they don't want you changing their game. But yeah. newer games are a little more open to uh, allow. I'll admit, I've never done room. it. Yeah. I have never done it. Now, Race for the Galaxy game, we talk about much on the show, and the aspect I never talked about is they always include cards. And they've got the icons on them, so you just have to like write the text and stuff. Right. They've always included that. That's not. It, I don't. Know, that's never been anything I've ever. I told you I don't want to design games. I guess. <laughs> I guess even designing a component. See, I'm thinking like anachrony. It has extra little triangles, and I had to take one because I lost one with a mech on it. And that's all I used it for. Right. But yeah, making your own cards, making your own components for games. Same. You know what? I there's more for board gaming. If you make a box insert. Whether you purchase one, I guess that's another, but if you make one yourself, like that's definitely you did. Or if you upgrade the components, if you go and 3D print or you paint the miniatures, totally all, any of those upgrades you do for your board games are artifacts that are going to stick with that game for all future plays. Absolutely. Artifact just seems weird to call it that, but board game <laughs> upgrades, I, 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 it's a weird use of the word, but I think it totally counts. Board game bling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your your clays that you you went out and bought specially yeah. for this game because you play it so often and you couldn't couldn't deal with whatever chips or chits they had. It had paper money, money that it had. Oh yes. God, don't even. Yeah, not even. <laughs> but get uh, into the know, paper money. Whatever, whatever you've done to to bring your game to that next level, um, because you enjoy it so much, you know, to to show that to bring your love of it, and you know, the people who yeah. the people who are really who have the money and love terraforming Mars, who go to that, that 3d printed mm -hmm. uh, tiles and stuff like that. You know, another one too, it goes with house rules is um, when you create your own scenarios, which again, I don't do it, but like, there are a lot of people out there like Hogwarts. We were just talking about, there are people who have made all kinds of new scenarios for Hogwarts battle. There are all kinds of people who have made new Gloomhaven scenarios, fan created scenarios, um, adventures, same with going back to RPGs too. Go on the DMs Guild and look at the number of people publishing third-party D and D modules nowadays. It like, blows me away. Well, I mean, we but, talked about in in our Jaws Gloomhaven review, uh, Jaws Gloomhaven review, the uh, Jaws and Lion Gloomhaven review. Yes. Uh, how the the fan created content from Gloomhaven became part of Jaws of the Lion. Yeah. Um, and fan created games sometimes become games, right? Like someone took Scythe and made a kids version based on My Little Pony that was taken up by Stonemeyer games who rethemed it to my little side. Right. But he took this, my little pony game and turned it over. Like that is definitely a thing. Like if you make or make your own game, that's definitely going to be an artifact of your game. <laughs> I guess that's a little too blatant at that point, but I'm just saying anything you make to enhance the game or add to it again, painting miniatures, adding to it. That is definitely something we didn't think of. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. Filling out the blank cards. That's a good one. Uh, Arkham Horror had a Jeff saying it had a pretty strong community creating fan created character cards or great yep. old one cards. I mean, realistically, any game you go to on BGG has got something Most, yeah. in the files of, of player of player themes. And I mean, sometimes it may be as simple as, hey, 
I didn't have anyone to play this game with, so I developed this solo version of the there game. There are a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of that. Um, now, I, I would say that might not be, you know, artifact-wise, that's that person's artifact, even if that's I take that it person's, on. Yeah. But again, it's, it is an artifact. Even if it's not my artifact, it's theirs uh, for, for board games. Uh, Jeff notes the one player who writes notes constantly in a journal about the game. That's an artifact. We did mention player notes, but specifically a journal or game journal definitely counts, as well as a, a, the DM's notebook. Yep. I also yep. think definitely counts. Um, published module filled with sticky notes for changes and comments. Again, same deal we talked about for rule books. But yeah, your published module. The thing is, I don't know how many people keep those. Right. Like that only becomes an artifact if you keep it, right? right. If, if, if you then put that module back and you put all your sticky notes in it, comments in it, or if you're a maniac like Sean and actually write in the module, <laughs> then you get an artifact. Yes, it is. I didn't know Sean been, wrote in his books. It has been pointed out that I am a savage because I wow. write in my RPG books. Wow. Uh, Yep. You and Dyson Logos. Dyson Logos like adds new pictures to the monster manual and everything. I, I, I don't know. I can't do it. I, can't that, do I, mean, it. I, I have a great respect for books, but I consider, oh, it's, it's but, a I, but I consider I, 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 like a player's guide to be the same as, you know, those university books that I had to take notes in. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's, so. it's a tool. I, I totally get it. I just can't do it. Yeah. I'd have to buy a second copy. I own second copies of I, most of like the players' handbooks. I think I, I even own second copies of the players' and handbook. And I never drew in any but, of them. Yeah. So Jeff for Dungeon Crawl Classics has his stack of dead peasants from yeah. various public games. See, that's that's something to be proud of. I, <laughs> I would have that. Like I would put that somewhere with, and I'd have like a tombstone that yeah. says like dead punt characters from funnels or something, and put it on top to intimidate the players. One of the ones I always wanted to do for Dungeon Crawl Classics is um marks which is actually carryover from, it's actually from a different RPG. Um, oh, what is it called? Hackmaster, where, where you're supposed to be proud of the TPK and you're supposed to put kill marks on your DM screen. I've been really tempted to do that. And, and Dee's saying she doesn't even write in her university books, but I, I wrote in my university books no, and I, I still have them. That. And they are, as far as I'm concerned, artifacts. artifacts. Yeah, uh, They are artifacts of my university career. Uh, and in many cases, they are actually, because of, because I went to school for theater technical production, they are actually reference books that I still refer yes. to. Um, yeah, reference books are definitely, I, there are, is a thing. Um, no, Ryan, I didn't poison anything. Yes, there were lead in those miniatures, but they were primed. <laughs> Once you prime the miniatures, you're not eating. Unless, unless I take them home and eat yeah, them. Unless they're no chewing would, on them. Unless they're chewing on them, those are perfectly safe miniatures. They are not only primed, they were sealed with Tester's Dull Coat because I wanted the paint jobs to last. They actually turned out really good. Like, like you're looking at 1978 miniatures with like a Y2K paint job. Like, I, I tried my hardest on these. I think they turned out fantastic for how blobby the miniatures were. And Dave is pointing out a, a really sort of uh, interesting and, and almost problematic thing with modern art role-playing, especially in this particular year, where most of our on, our role playing is online, and even yeah, our board game playing is online. Where unless you remember to screenshot, um, mm -hmm. you know, or chat log, you, you you don't really have a lot to consider an artifact. No, um, it's true. Unless, and we didn't really go into this, you record actual plays. Yeah, uh, which an actual play is an artifact for everyone involved. Yeah, because actual plays can be a few things, right? It can be your momentum. It can also be your reminder, your what happened last. Yep. It can be a teaching tool, especially when you go into board games, how to play different games. Actual plays are definitely now, they're a modern RPG artifact yep. or a gaming artifact in general. Yep. And that's that you don't even necessarily have to uh, broadcast and stream your, your actual play. No, you play. don't. Nope. You can, you know, you, there's no reason you can't record it for your own group. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't comfortable out there streaming mm -hmm. things. And I totally, uh, totally uh, understand that. But that doesn't mean you can't record it for within your own use. Jeff's talking about using blank business cards and index cards. So that was another pro tip from Phil Vecchione was collect all the index cards. Give everyone index cards and collect them at the end and keep them as, yeah. as again, mementos, but also as reminders, mostly as reminders. Um, we're talking a bit about... Yeah, I and I think I, I I actually had never uh, index cards. Yes, but I uh, they were yeah, talking in the chat cards. about using blank business cards, and I'd never actually done that. Smaller. Jeff Jeff points out that they're great for clocks for uh, for blades and Forge in the Dark. Makes and that's sense. Actually, really makes a whole lot of sense for uh, for clocks. 
So Ryan's asking, when you choose to strip something out physically, or do those removed things become artifacts themselves, or only the customized set or document? It would depend, right? Like, uh, like the physical artifact is how you did it. Like if you're writing in your rule book and crossing things off, your rule book's a thing. But if you're making notes on in your DM guidebook of I'm removing this, um, as for removing something physically, like I've never done it in a board game. If I play in a board game and there's an aspect I don't like, I just keep it in the box and don't leave it there. That mostly happens with expansions, but it's not often I'd throw it out. And I guess um, I technically for a while kept all my expansion boxes those were artifacts, I guess, to remind me that I had the expansions. I, I don't have, I never had an attachment to them. So I eventually recycled them all. But if I had taken those and put them into wall art, yeah, it might mean something. Yeah, I, I, I had never even considered the wall art. I, I expect when I got rid of all the DC uh, deck builder uh, boxes that I'd collected, because again, they were just, they were all compiled into that one, uh, that one box. So I didn't need any of them. Or it's not being an artifact, I guess. It was, it was, yeah. Yeah. No, Hogwarts, not being... Hogwarts, I think is, is, I mean, I suppose it if, doesn't you kept, change. if you There's kept no the deck made. boxes, those would be artifacts, but yeah. I don't know why you would. Cause they were just playing. No, that's fair. Playing card boxes. Fair enough. Okay. I got one wrong. <laughs> Pokemon Splendor. People are talking about Splendor. Hey, math guy, Dave. <laughs> uh, recorded as a pilot. A lot of people yeah. recorded their games before podcasting was popular. Yep. Um, uh, a lot of people would put out uh, like a little pocket recorder on the table. That was a great GM tip, to be honest. So you could listen to yourself afterwards because, oh, is it cringeworthy? You're like, oh, geez, <laughs> did I really do that? But at the hey, same Danielle, time, it's also... you, you missed the awesome RPG topic tonight. But it it's a a at the same time, even if even if you're cringing at your voice or uh, you know the, what you said that time, it's you're it's going to be way more accurate for what actually happened mm -hmm. than any notes you're going to be taking. Um, there's a reason why a lot of students record there are professors in university. <laughs> it's yep. a great way to take notes. Yeah, it's a good way to take notes. But yeah, that's that's totally a valid thing. I've never done it. I, I've been tempted. Now that we do this, I should be more comfortable with it. But <laughs> I don't know. Things. Well, and I think a lot RPGs. of it is there are a lot of people out there who aren't comfortable, and so make making sure you you've got to go through and do that whole extra aspect of session zero yeah. to make sure people are are comfortable with that that level of recording. <laughs> 